In this video, we'll be discussing what is perhaps the most widely cited paragraph in all of moral philosophy. It's an argument tacked on at the end of a chapter, almost as an afterthought, that the 18th century philosopher David Hume claimed would, quote, subvert all the vulgar systems of morality, end quote. So now, in keeping with philosophical tradition, here's the quote. In every system of morality which I have hitherto met with, I've always remarked that the author proceeds for some time in the ordinary way of reasoning and establishes the being of a god or makes observations concerning human affairs when of a sudden I'm surprised to find that instead of the usual copulations of propositions is and is not, I meet with no proposition that is not connected with an ought or an ought not. This change is imperceptible, but is, however, of the last consequence. For as this ought or ought not expresses some new relation or affirmation, it's necessary that it should be observed and explained, and at the same time that a reason should be given for what seems altogether inconceivable, how this new relation can be a deduction from the others, which are entirely different from it. Okay, what did all that mean? It's easiest to explain what that meant by using an example. So I'll use the following argument. First premise. If you have a cold or flu and you're around others, then you risk infecting them. Second premise. If you infect them, they might get seriously ill, perhaps even die. Third premise. Wearing a mask will help prevent you from infecting them. And now the conclusion. If you have a cold or flu and you're around others, then you ought to wear a mask. David Hume says that this argument and any argument that's relevantly similar to this argument is invalid. Why is it invalid? Because, says David Hume, every premise in this argument is an is statement. It's descriptive. It describes the world. Every statement is a statement that you can verify by talking to somebody who's an expert in infectious disease. That expert knows these things as a result of experiment and scientific investigation. But the conclusion is an ought statement. It's a prescription. It prescribes wearing a mask when one is around others. Prescriptions don't tell you how the world is. They tell you how the world ought to be. As Hume tells us, this shift from is premises, premises that describe the world, to an ought conclusion that prescribes some action, well, in Hume's words, quote, this change is imperceptible, but is, however, of the last consequence. For as this ought or ought not expresses some new relation or affirmation, it's necessary that it should be observed and explained, and at the same time that a reason should be given for what seems altogether inconceivable, how this new relation can be a deduction from others which are entirely different from it. In other words, how do you get an ought, a prescriptive conclusion, out of a collection of is or descriptive premises? The person who wants us to accept this conclusion, based on these premises, needs to provide us with an explanation as to how this makes sense. The standard way of dealing with this difficulty, at least since Hume pointed it out, is to argue that there must be at least one prescriptive premise. For example, we could insert into the previous argument the following premise. You ought to do those things that will prevent you from causing others to become seriously ill or die. With this premise added, one can now infer the conclusion that one ought to wear a mask when one has a cold or flu and one is around others, given the fact that wearing a mask can prevent you from causing others to become seriously ill or die. Now the argument makes a kind of sense. Let's look at another example. This example will have only one premise. Animals in nature do not have homosexual relationships. Now this turns out to be false, but for the sake of argument, let's assume that it's true. Or if you want, let us assume that you're arguing against somebody who asserts that this is true and refuses to accept any evidence to the contrary. You certainly don't want to argue that whatever non-human animals do, it is permissible for humans to do. Are you aware of the types of behaviors that animals engage in? The conclusion of this argument is that 
since animals do not engage in homosexual relationships, then humans ought not to engage in homosexual relationships. The way this is commonly expressed is to say that homosexual relationships are unnatural. Now, Hume tells us that this type of reasoning is invalid. You have a descriptive is premise and a prescriptive ought conclusion, and you can't derive an ought conclusion from purely factual premises. What animals do tells us nothing about what humans should do. To complete this argument, one would have to add a prescriptive premise. The prescriptive premise that's needed to complete this argument would have to say something like, what animals in nature do not do, it is wrong for humans to do. But then this premise is clearly false. Tell me, when's the last time you saw an animal select and listen to a YouTube video so that he can understand the problem of deriving prescriptive ought conclusions from is premises? How many animals have performed brain surgery recently, or programmed a web page, or played a game of solitaire? So the argument fails. It doesn't provide anything like a good reason to reject or condemn homosexual relationships. If somebody wants to show that homosexual relationships warrant condemnation, they're going to need a different argument. So the takeaway point for this lecture is that if you're going to engage in moral argument, make sure that the argument does not go from purely factual premises to moral conclusions. If you encounter somebody trying to argue from factual premises to moral conclusions, see if you can discover or dig out the missing moral premise that would be required to make that argument valid. And then see if you can find reason to believe that the moral premise is false. And by the way, if their factual premises are true, and you can't defeat the ought premise that's needed to generate a not conclusion, then this suggests that the individual making that argument is right. They have at least given some genuine weight to their moral conclusion. 